Hello and welcome to the DSP Project, your weekly fix of music production and technology. I'm your host Rupert Brown and this week is quite a special review. We're going to be looking at Prism Sounds Orpheus. So first of all, let's take a closer look. On the front we've got two instrument inserts which break inputs one and two when used. We've got a highly funky metering system on the front that gives us uh, volume and some of the input status. We've got a volume encoder that has a LED halo ring around the outside. We've got two headphone inputs with their own individual volume controls and a standby button. On the back we've got a mains fuse, IEC power, firewire in and out, MIDI in and out, world clock in and out, coaxial and optical audio, the optical does ADAT as well. We've got eight outputs, line outputs that have uh, Prism's famous conversion on them, four line inputs with that same conversion as well as uh, inputs one to four uh, mic pre's as well and instruments one and two uh, instrument inputs and so we can put uh, turntables in there as well. All of the mic pre's have switchable phantom power as well as you can do a uh, high pass filter, swap the phase and do mid and side as well. So this is the software control panel that comes with the Orpheus. I'm not going to go into every single detail, but just to quickly run through it with you. You've got the global settings at the top here, so we can sync to an external clock, use this as a clock out. We can set the, the front panel meters to show either the, in, the uh, incoming audio or the outgoing audio on all uh, eight outputs. We've got our input setup which is, allows us to change the phase, we've got a high pass filter, we can do phantom power, we've got the overkiller which is like a soft clipper limiter uh, type thing, uh, we can switch between um, Toslink or SPDIF digital inputs. On the output side of things we can assign what um, what outputs are controlled by the main volume control here, so we, if we want we can disable them. Uh, if we want a gain stage maybe we've got like a, an analog um, volume control on the on the output section. We can also control what um, what comes through the headphones here. So we can select the headphones for, to uh, link that onto whichever output we want. On the uh, the mixes here, you can see above these tabs we've got analog output one, one and two, analog output three and four, and so on. Um, we can link these between being stereo or if you want separate volume control if you're using them as as mono channels. Um, and we can basically create an entire, uh, a complete submix just for that output. And it's all ultra low latency because it's all happening inside of the hardware. So you don't need to worry about any delay as far as monitoring back if someone's uh, recording. Or if you wanted to, you could use this in a live situation and create a separate monitor mix for the, the, st the stage, let's say. Um, and so yeah, you've got a complete mixer for each of the, the stereo outputs. Um, and then that can then be saved and recalled at a later date. Um, we can even create a headphone mix. We've got ADAT which I haven't got enabled at the moment and then a little diagram of how the uh, how the circuit inside of the Orpheus works which can be a pretty handy reference. Um, all in all it's not bad, it's not the world's most intuitive but it's fine, it's perfectly usable uh, interface. The only thing I wish I had a bit more control over was the routing for the Firewire audio where the Firewire audio comes in. Um, I can basically only choose what output that goes to inside of the actual DAW or operating system that it's running on. So for instance, I wanted to send the one audio coming down the Firewire bus, one stereo pair, and in my DAW I wanted to send it to two outputs, and I basically can't do that with this software, whereas you can do that with uh, a, a number of other audio interfaces. So uh, a little bit lacking in flexibility there. Uh, in, in order to do that, in the end, I had to go digitally out, uh, out of the SPDIF and then back into the spit if so it came in as an input. Um, so then when it's coming as an input like this then we can go and go to any of the outputs and, and decide to, to mix that mix that out. So that is probably only the, the one little gripe I had regarding the software side of things. Now the audio interface market is a crowded one and you can find uh, a Firewire recording interface with the same sort of ins and outs as the Orpheus for a lot less money than what the, uh, than what the Orpheus goes for. So you might be wondering what makes it so special? Well to answer that question we have to look at 
Prism Sound as a company. Now Prism Sound have been producing professional audio products for over 24 years now and they're definitely world leaders in the field of conversion. All of the top studios that I've been to here in the UK, uh, if you want to talk about Fluid Mastering who we did the, uh, the interview with Tim Debney or Metropolis which is a huge, uh, very, very successful high profile studio uh, here in London, um, the, the, all the mastering rooms there I've been into are using Prism Sound for their conversion. Now, of course, those big boys are using um, the sort of more of the top of the line. We're talking about the Prism Dream, which is a, a two channel uh, pure uh, digital to analog converter, and I think that comes in about five and a half grand or something. So, we're talking about some very serious level conversion here. Um, so, in comparison, the, the Orpheus, um, I'm, I'll let you know now, the price tag on this thing is £3,300. I think that's about the, sh the street price you can get it for. Um, so at first you might think, well, that sounds pretty expensive, but then when you consider that you're getting five, uh, sorry, not five, eight rounds of Prism Sounds, analog to digital, digital to analog conversion, uh, all the mic pre's and, and everything else that go with that, it's definitely the more affordable, um, uh, affordable solution. So um, yes, it is expensive as far as uh, audio interfaces is, are concerned, but you are stepping into a, a whole nother league of conversion. So let's talk about the let's talk about the sound quality, how this thing sounds. Uh, I wanted to give it a uh, a really good opponent to really test it. Now I put it up against a Bryson Bryson uh, BD BDA1. I think that's the model number. It is a uh, two-channel uh, dig digital to analog converter made by Bryston. It, I think that comes in about two and a half grand, and that's all it does. It just does two channels uh, of of conversion. It is probably uh, what has been my reference stack as far as um, testing out other other converters. So I I ran that into some uh, ATC SEM 100 monitors, um, and I was expecting. Um, I thought it was going to be hard yakka for for the for the Orpheus. So how did it sound? Well, in comparison, the Orpheus sounded just better. Um, to try and explain it, it was kind of like someone had taken a uh, a sheet off the off the tweeters. <laughs> in comparison, there's just it just opened up, and the um, the the I mean the sound stage was beautiful, but particularly the high end was just so clear, um, and the the sound stage was just it just just got wider. It was like the the speakers moved a little bit further apart, and someone took a, a blanket off the off the tweeters. It was really quite impressive. Now that's not to take anything away from the Bryston. It's a good, clean, um, reliable DAC, but. Uh, yeah, in comparison, the Orpheus definitely uh, was, in my opinion, a, a superior product. Um, the bass as well, it was just uh, more defined and, and tighter to the point where it almost sounded like the bass was slightly louder coming out of the Orpheus, but I think it was only because the, the definition was just that little bit tighter that it made it um, seem slightly more pronounced. Um, so I was, I was really impressed, really impressed. It is an amazing sounding DAC. Now it's not all it's not all happy days though. I do have my criticisms for the Orpheus. Um, the the volume knob on the front feels kind of plasticky, and for a product of this price, I thought it should feel like a really nice metal uh, sort of encoder on the front there. But it's it does feel a bit and it does feel a little bit cheaper than than what it could be. Um, the the level meters on the front they call them meters. I think they should be called indicators because you can sort of get a vague idea of what's what's going on with these colored segments. I mean, they look cool, they look very unique, and I think that's obviously the point. They're, they're there just to be uh, an indicator and look impressive, but uh, they're not particularly useful as far as seeing any idea of, of sort of what, how much level's coming in. On top of that, they, they don't mask each, uh, each one, so there's quite a lot of bleed that comes through from from the, if one meter's going, then the next kind of meter over has a lot of light bleeding through. So it can look like the channel next to it has got audio going through it when really there's nothing going through it at all. Um, so yeah, it's the the metering system not great, but I mean I, I don't, it's not designed to be an accurate meter. It's designed to, as something that's kind of funky and looks a bit different. So I mean in that sense, it does uh, it does the job. 
Um, the only other, my only other complaint was uh, some, what I was speaking about before was with regard to the the routing. Um, again, so something of this price, I would have expected uh, exceedingly flexible routing. Um, but as far as what you can do with the audio coming from the Firewire bus, you are a little bit limited in that sense. Um, as far as mixing is concerned, it's great if you've got uh, external sources coming in, coming in to the to the inputs, the digital inputs, or to the uh, to the analog inputs. You can then create a complete separate submix, as we saw to any 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 which output. So um, that side of it's good, but again, I think there could be just a little bit more flexibility in the the, the software side of things. However, all of these things, though, all these little gripes they really fall away in the face of just how amazing this thing sounds. It really is phenomenal. Um, now I do want to, uh, although I do want to, I want to qualify this a little bit with you. So when I talk about conversion, as far as the, the sound goes and the scale of conversion, it's amazing. There's a huge difference between uh, the cheapest converter that you'll find in your iPod as opposed to something like the Orpheus. That being said though, I'm only talking in the scale of conversion. So. The difference between between those two products won't be as extreme as if you went from, let's say, a little radio speaker up to big studio monitors. Um, and if you're starting out, then you might only notice a small, if subtle, difference between between the two. Um, and it's only when you uh, it's only when you get a bit more experience, a bit more ear training, that you that you really start to lock on to the differences. The closest thing I can compare it to is uh, like MP3s. If you've been listening to MP3s through earbuds all your life, then you're probably not going to know any better and think that it sounds all right. But then when you get a, a, a nice pair of speakers, a good playback system and you start A-being a -being between the two and listening to an MP3, an uncompressed audio, um, after a while your brain will lock onto the differences and you'll, and you'll really hear, hear it. And while it might only seem like a subtle difference at first, once you, uh, again, once you lock onto them, you'll never want to go back. And that's kind of how it is with good conversion. It's, um, relatively speaking, it's not a huge difference, but the, um, they are beautiful when you, really, when you can really hear them. It's, it's a beautiful thing. So... Um, the, the, my whole point in this spiel is to say that you don't need to spend this much money on an audio interface to make great music. Um, there's people making fantastic music on far less um, equipped equipment than this. Uh, that being said though, if you want a really quality professional product um, that sounds just about as good as as an audio interface can sound, then the Orpheus definitely needs to be on your short list of things to listen to. That has been my review of the Prism Orpheus. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions about the Orpheus, please head down to the dspproject.com, leave a message under this video, and I will answer it for you. I, um, I really don't want to send this thing back. I have fallen in love with it, and I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to, uh, to hold on to it, because it, is, it really is fantastic. Anyway, that is, uh, that's the review done. Uh, a few little notes. We've... Um, uh, we've got a new app out. We've got an app for Boxy. So if you use uh, Boxy, um, Boxy, if you don't know, is a program for watching internet and um, and your all sorts of media on your TV. Uh, so if you've got Boxy, head into the App Store, type in the DSP project or something like that, and uh, you'll find us in there. So there's DSP Project Boxy app. We've got um, a discount from Loop Masters as well, the sample people. If you want to buy some samples at checkout, use the code DSP10 and that will give you 10% off the cost of your order. And I think that's about it. We've got a new competition coming. I can't quite tell you about it yet, but it will be, uh, it's coming just around the corner. Some uh, exciting new things in store. So uh, that is all for this week's episode of the DSP Project. I'll see you next week.